Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk, coming to you this morning from the Afro Middle East Center in Johannesburg. We're at the Afro Middle East Center because we're going to focus our discussion this morning on events in the Middle East, which, as you know, have been very much in the news these past few weeks. Starting with Egypt's failed revolution a few weeks back, when a military coup removed the democratically elected government and reinstalled Egypt's generals. And then moving on to the situation in Syria, which as we all know is incredibly topical at the moment, with the Obama administration threatening military action on the Syrian government for what it claims are chemical attacks that took place and which it blames the uh, Syrian government for. Helping us to make sense of these issues this morning is Naeem Gina, the director of the Afro Middle East Center. Welcome to Saxis, Naeem. Thank you. Fiddler. I'd like you to unpack for us what's going on in the Middle East. We'll start with Syria, particularly the popular movement that called for the removal of a dictator that's now been co-opted by forces much bigger than itself. We've seen what's happened in Syria. We've seen the, uh, the failed revolution of Egypt, which has its roots in citizens' action. The problem is that citizens' action is not leading to the realization of democratic rights for people in the Middle East. And I'd like to have a conversation about that and, and its meaning for South Africa. Let me start by, by saying, and perhaps kind of a word of caution, if you like, that um, I think partly because of the great excitement that we all were guilty of, uh, <laughs> of promoting um, two and a half years ago, when the uprisings began in Tunisia and then Egypt, Libya, Libya etc., um, that we, we kind of, I think, forgot that... Um, that uprisings, transitions, etc., are actually pretty messy businesses. Um, I mean, just just think about South Africa in in the 80s and in the early 90s. Okay, um, we didn't have one movement uh, within the country that was opposing the state. We had a number of them. Um, in the 80s and and early 90s, you might remember a number of them were fighting against each other. I mean, we had we had no go areas in our country. Not, uh, I'm not talking about those no-go areas that were no-go for the SADF, for the Defense Force, but no-go for people from other political groups. Um, so in one township you'd have an ANC-controlled, UDF-controlled area, and then an Azapo-controlled area, and God forbid that one of the people crosses over into the other side, they could get killed. You know, I mean, that's how messy things are. Um, in, in, in some ways, what happened in, uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, you know, two and a half years ago, was a bit then, or we made it seem a bit abnormal uh, to to how these things normally turn out. So we all got excited, and um, you know, but hang on, I mean, to be fair to the way people around the world reacted, the people of Egypt and Tunisia did manage to get dictators toppled. Sure, but uh, but these things are not two week processes. Um, they, they take a long time. I mean, we're still in a transitionary process here. Uh, many would argue, you know, almost 20 years later. Um, secondly, this, this notion that, um, you know, of, of these so-called leaders, leaderless revolutions um, is, is a misnomer, really. They were, firstly, they were neither leaderless nor were they revolutions, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, you spoke about failed revolution in, in Egypt. I, I don't agree. Uh, because I don't think there was a revolution in the first place. Um, so, so all of these... Kind of How would you define it then? What happened? I think what we had was we had, we had popular uprisings that took place. We had the overthrow of a dictator, but we didn't actually have any kind of fundamental transformation within society. Yes, it moved from uh, a military dictatorship to what seemed like the beginning of a democratic process. But even within that uh, seeming democratic process, the military ensured that it was in charge. So there was no fundamental transition. The, the, the levers of power didn't really shift um, to, to the people or to anyone very much different. Um, the, um, you, you had five elections and referenda that took place. But we now know that even through that period, the, the military was really very much in charge of, of things. Um, and so it's not a failed revolution. The revolution hasn't taken place. 
um, you know, some Egyptians will say they had two revolutions. No, you had you had um, you had you had popular uprisings. You had uh, a dictator being thrown out, and and really, frankly, the dictator was kicked out by the army of which he was a part, because also because he was becoming inconvenient for them. Um, and then you had democratic elections, uh, parliament elected, and then parliament dissolved by the by the army. You had uh, democratic elections for a president, and before he took office, his powers were reduced by the army. Um, and immediately he took power, um, the army planned on how to get rid of him. And a year later, he was gotten rid of. Um, and they uh, now, um, not, I wouldn't say back in charge, because they've always been in charge, but much more forcefully uh, and much more clearly to everyone that they are the ones in charge. Um, so, in, you know, I don't want to put too bleak a uh, 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 picture on it, but, but I think that we, we need to understand where things are. So, um, two years down the line, um, people feel a great sense of disappointment, which, which, is, which is necessary, I think, but it also needs to be understood that two years is actually not a long period. In, in the process of um, consciousness developing and in the process of political transition. Um, coming back to Syria, if, if, if I may. Um, I mean, what, what we saw in Syria was, despite uh, you know, uh, President Bashar al-Assad's um, insistence about some kind of Syrian exceptionalism, that all the stuff happening in these other countries won't get here because we are so great and we are anti-imperialist and we are anti-Zionist, etc., um, the fact of the matter was that there were deep-seated grievances, uh, genuine grievances that people had against the government and against the state. Um, and as, as with the other countries where these uprisings had taken place already, um, by March uh, 2011 in, in Syria, um, the grievances in a sense fell into two categories. Um, one might say three, but two, two categories. The one was economic. Um, socio-economic grievances, and, and so in Syria what we found was that over the past decade, um, before that Syria was this socialist Arab uh, republic, um, as, as it called itself. But over the past decade, or just under a decade, there was a move towards uh, more liberal, neoliberal econ economics. Um, the result of that, in a very short space of time, was uh, accumulation of wealth um, w with a minority, um, and that minority included a number of people from, uh, from the Ba'ath Party or the family of, uh, of, of the president. So the richest man in, um, um, in, uh, in Syria is Rami Makhlouf, who uh, uh, operates his business, uh, his, his business practice um, very um, in, in a way that people don't like. Um, so, for example, if you want to get a license for fishing, you have to make sure that Rami Makhlouf has a share in your business. Um, so, so that move towards uh, neoliberal economics uh, ensured that what happened was that poor people began to be worse off than they were before. Um, because slowly the, 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 the welfare net, if you like, the social kind of net, uh, economic net that was there began to be whittled away. Uh, poverty began to be uh, to increase. People started being unemployed, um, which you know the kind of thing that you didn't see. So on the one hand, there were these socio-economic grievances. Um, people were getting worse off, uh, particularly in in the rural areas, but in general, right? Um, and then together with that, still within that category, is uh, particularly in the in the east, you had a period of drought for a few years. And with the drought, uh, the peasantry, small farmers um, began to be in a bad state, and you had a movement to urban areas, and that put greater pressure on the economy. So you had all of these factors, um, some natural, but, but others um, coming from the, the political situation, um, these socioeconomic factors, and then you had the political factors. So you, you had Syria, a country, where there was no dem uh, demo democracy, no democratic practice, where the security services, the mukhabarat, as, as they're known, um, very well penetrated into, into society. I mean, people were spying on their neighbors, um, you know, to, to that extent. Um, there was no freedom of expression. There was no freedom to form political parties uh, in general. I mean, of course, opposition groups did exist, but mostly underground. 
So you had these political grievances, economic grievances, and as many of the slogans throughout the region um, uh, said when, when the uprisings began, that the big thing was dignity. When, when, you, when you don't, when you can't fulfill your economic uh, needs and you know, have to live with, with uh, poverty, etc., and you don't have um, uh, political rights and, and, and are treated like a subclass, uh, then the issue of just human dignity becomes a big thing. And so the, these were the reasons, as with the other countries, um, that people then took to the streets um, in, in Syria um, demanding reforms. At the beginning of the uprising two and a half years ago, um, people, were, people took to the streets calling for reforms, not for the overthrow of the government, uh, not for the overthrow of, uh, of uh, the president. Um, even though some of the initial slogans, particularly by young people, said that, you know, just um, echoing the slogans in, in other countries. But that's been amplified internationally. Mm. Um, the slogans calling for the, re the, the people removal demand, uh, of Assad. The downfall of the regime. Yes. yes, no, but that happened later. So, so initially, when you look at the banners even and the slogans, um, people were talking of, of uh, you know, calling on our beloved Bashar to make sure that there were reforms, that things got better for us. And these were um, socio-economic reforms? Socio-economic and political, right? Um, because there was, you know, part of the political was also the torture and all of that that, that took place. Um, the regime didn't respond uh, well to that. Um, so the response was very heavy-handed. Uh, military was brought in um, into towns and, and cities, etc. Um, and so from, from the opposition, that also began to change. And, and that, so today, that kind of peaceful, if you like, non-violent um, action is virtually non-existent. Uh, people are running from snipers. They're really not, <laughs> not going to take to the streets with, with banners. Um, so so th that began to change then from, from the opposition side. And when that change started taking place, um, and particularly when you had a few uh, defectors from the army, um, who said, okay, we'll, we'll protect now these, uh, these marches, etc., uh, from, from the regime, that, that, that began to take on an armed kind of uh, character, and then you had people coming from outside uh, as well. Um, you had the flow of weapons in, into the country uh, from, from various, various parties, um, and, and it's developed now into what we have now, which is a civil war. So what happened in terms of the, the struggles becoming co-opted in Syria? by other forces, the broader forces, yeah. the regional interests, the international interests? This, this, is, this is now the big problem uh, for me. I mean, you know, um, and, and even though um, I belong to an institute that does kind of geopolitical research, the tragedy in Syria is now that when we talk about Syria, it's, it's become about everyone else. Uh, you talk about Syria and it's about the role of the Saudis and the Iranians and the Russians and the Americans and whether the Americans are going to bomb and whether they should bomb or not. Um, and ordinary Syrian people have been in a sense forgotten. Um, they've become in many ways the, 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 the fodder uh, for all sides to, to use. Um, and and that, that, that's a big problem. So, you know, what, what, what you're calling the co-option of, um, of, of that struggle, that, that non-violent struggle, citizens' action, calling for reforms initially and then, and then later calling for the, uh, for the overthrow of the regime once they felt that the regime wasn't responding. Um, that that co-option kind of, it, I'm, I'm not sure that we would call it, that I would call it a co-option, but it's, it was a kind of morphing from where it was, that non-violent action, um, into what people felt was uh, the, the necessity for, for it to take a different character, which was a violent uh, move. When, when that happened, then, you know, things couldn't be, um, couldn't be contained. Um, so, so the groups now that are part of the opposition on the ground, and, you know, of course, there's the political opposition outside the country, but uh, there's also then the political action, uh, opposition within the country, which uh, w part of which maintains uh, very jealously guards its kind of non-violent uh, character. Um, but then there's the, the, the military opposition on the ground in Syria. And within that military opposition, there's a whole plethora of groups um, and a whole spectrum of ideologies, um, from just nationalist to kind of um, um, extreme Islamist, uh, 
um, and, and a whole range of things in between um, as, as well. Um, and many of these groups, of course, are supported uh, materially um, in terms of weapons, etc., from, from the outside. Um, so you have um, Saudi Arabia deciding that it's going to support particular groups because they reflect what Saudi Arabia would like to see. Saudi Arabia is course, not really great on uh, democracy. Huh? Um, <laughs> uh, Qatar supporting you know, groups that, that it would like to see uh, being ascendant um, and, and other countries uh, on, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, as far as the regime is concerned, re receiving support from Russia, from, uh, from Iran, those two countries in, in particular. Um, and so you have now this kind of really messy situation where where if you talk about citizens' action, you know, people would kind of scratch their heads and where, where is it? Because what you have now is a military civil war that, that's taking place. This is not to say that those groups, uh, those local committees that, that uh, took forward the nonviolent action um, you know, two and a half years ago, that they don't exist or that they've all taken up weapons. Uh, neither of that is true. Um, they do exist. Um, you do find, um, you know, occasional protests taking place uh, here or there, um, and then a whole range of other kinds of um, civilian action, um, trying to uh, protect refugees or work with the refugees, trying to ensure in some places that um, education happens, um, as difficult as that, that might be when you're under attack, and, and a whole range of other kind of uh, things like that. that that civil society groups, however organized or unorganized, uh, find themselves playing. What does this then mean for people's movements in other parts of the world? What does it mean for South Africa particularly? We are at a very interesting period in South Africa's history, 20 years after apartheid. The ANC has never been weaker, I think, in the last 20 years than it is today splits in the alliance, weakness of the party, new political parties emerging from people that used to support the ANC, uh, new movements on the ground, new trade unions that are being formed, all in some way saying that they represent the real will of the people and the real desires uh, for what people want to see in terms of change in South Africa. Uh, it's a very interesting period in our history. Um, I'm going to ask you to look into the future a little bit based on the experiences of what's happened in the Middle East, because you've re uh, researched that quite a lot. And tell us what you think about the potential for these new movements and shifts on the ground in South Africa to result in a, a new destiny for our country. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, less than Syria perhaps, um, to, to answer your question, I think less than Syria, perhaps Egypt and, and Tunisia would be more instructive uh, for, for South Africa. But having said that, just a word of caution that I think in, in some senses um, um, the, the issue of, of what can we learn perhaps should be the other way around. I mean, we've, we've, um, we've gone through a longer process in our transitionary period than either Egypt or, or Tunisia. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there, there are things that, that we can share uh, from, from our side. But, but nevertheless, I, I think that, you know, if we look at, at both Egypt and Tunisia, for example, um, certainly the importance, and, and this goes back to two and a half years ago, when, when this is what we were saying, that um, in, in a sense, these, uh, these uprisings uh, rekindled the hope among activists and citizens around the world that people can make a difference. Um, you had, over the past um, couple of decades, this kind of movement towards um, uh, even authoritarianism within democratic societies. Uh, political, but certainly economic. Um, where the role of corporations and, and multinationals and um, global capital became so overwhelming and, and, and burdensome that ordinary people just didn't have any um, um, any wherewithal to be able to fight against that or, or to resist against that. Um, suddenly, two and a half years ago, you had people coming out onto the streets and then overthrowing a dictator who'd, who'd been, um, who'd been in, in power for decades, whichever country you're talking about, uh, whichever the, of these countries. 
Um, and, and being able to do that just by the force of, of the unhappiness, by the force of the numbers on the street, by the determination not to leave the street. And I think that that is um, certainly, even within South Africa, I think the reason that for many of us this was exciting was because of that potential, that yes, it can be done. Now, of course, this is not to suggest that in South Africa, like in many other countries, that um, citizens' action or, or um, uh, on-the-ground action had stopped. Um, it hadn't. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at... Um, the past six or seven years, um, the number of protests that, that take place in South Africa. You know, you're looking at uh, probably about 10 or 12 protests a day in various parts of the country on, on political and economic issues. Um, many of these, of course, go unreported because they, um, you know, in, in, in a small village somewhere, people block the road for, for the day and say we want, um, we want water or we want electricity or whatever. But that's what's happening. 10 or 12 protests a day in, in, in this country is, is, is a lot, right? Um, so it's, it's not like we, we all went to sleep. Um, that was happening. Um, we didn't have a central place like Tahrir Square where everyone came together every day, uh, but it has been happening. And, and, um, and, and so the, the hope that came out of these uprisings was, was very um, useful at that stage. But importantly is, is this, this notion that, um, that, that people, citizens, can't become complacent. I mean, what we saw in Egypt is, um, you know, within, in the space of about a year and a half, um, having had um, three elections, two referenda, um, by the fifth one of those, the, the referendum for the constitution, people were just tired of voting. Um, and so you had like less than 40% of the people actually voted for, for the new constitution. Uh, you know, 60 odd people said yes, but the point is that there were less than 40% that, that made the effort to, to go and vote. Um, and so many people kind of became, became tired, n n number one. Um, but at the same time, you had grievances that were not addressed, right? Um, Partly because, uh, because there was an undermining of any democratic uh, attempt to address them, um, and partly because these challenges are huge and, and can't be addressed within a few months. Now, I think in South Africa what we saw after 1994 was in a sense, and, and uh, perhaps part, you know, because of, partly because of our euphoria around at that time, but there was a sense of an acceptance that, um, that things take time to happen. Um, and so the government, the ANC government, was given some time. Um, and when it didn't fulfill that, you know, half a decade later, by 1998, 1999, 2000, um, you found then people saying, well, this is not working. You know, um, uh, by 1996, our economic policies seem to be actually worse than what they were a couple of years ago. Um, uh, by by the mid 2000s, you know, our inequality had gotten really bad. Uh, so, but but there was that that time frame which which people were willing to say that um, that these things do take time, um, and I think that, that that that's that's important. We didn't see that in Egypt, um, and partly because of the behind the scenes um, movements by uh, the military, for example by uh, countries like the United Arab Emirates, um, who then you know, poured lots of money into um, artificially creating grievances, uh, not that they, they were not there already, um, on the one hand. But then on the other hand, you had legitimate uh, protests, for example, from, uh, from workers' groups, from trade unions, um, for, for needs that were not being, not being, not being met. Um, so all, all of these things kind of came together, um, and, and you know, the, I think the lesson there then for, for us in South Africa is, as I said, this, this notion that you can't become complacent, that um, even when you have a democratically elected government, um, a government that, that, um, that all of us accept, that many of us support, um, even with that, um, that the, the, the pressures and the forces on, on that government, and I'm talking about South Africa, 
um, that exist on, on, on that government um, are, are huge from all sides. And if, if people become complacent, then you've removed that most legitimate of pressures on, on, on the government. And so the fact that we have 10 or 12 protests a day um, is good and necessary. Otherwise, the government could be even worse than, than it is at the moment. Um, and the fact that you have, um, whether in an organized fashion through new organizations uh, or in an unorganized way, that you have people coming together in neighborhoods or as organizations, national or whatever the case might be, um, social movements, etc., um, means that that pressure uh, is kept up on government and it needs to be. Otherwise, your kind of um, the move of South Africa towards um, neoliberalism becomes, uh, becomes a, a, a fait accompli. I don't think we're completely there yet. I think that you know, th there's still hope for South Africa. <laughs> um, but part th there's hope for South Africa partly because we have so much of dissent. Um, now, if you look at some of these countries, you, know, um, you look at Egypt, for example, the level of dissent before 2010 um, wasn't the same. Um, you had, you had you know, some political groups, uh, for example, that, um, that, that, that were dissenters, but you know, tried to uh, participate in parliamentary elections, whatever. You had the Muslim Brotherhood, which was the biggest dissenter, um, which organized protests now and then, etc., but was heavily repressed. Um, you had um, independent trade unions because the main trade union federation was a sweetheart union. I mean, um, its, its purpose really was to provide people ways of getting into the uh, upper echelons of the National Democratic Party yeah. rather than anything. Sounds familiar, yes. Um, so independent trade unions, particularly from around 2007-2008. But um, the, 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 the masses of Egyptians were, were not um, you know, willing to take action in the same kind of way. So the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a big organization uh, and big kind of network, independent trade unions, which were in particular areas, and then a few youth groups particularly supporting the trade unions. So very small, in a sense, um, uh, um, uh, mass of people um, that, that, that were dissenters, that were willing to confront the state in, in any kind of way. Um, we fortunately have a greater sense of uh, dissent um, and, and willingness to, to confront the state. Um, and I think that, that um, the fact that 20 years after our first democratic elections, that that kind of level is there, I think is very useful. Um, but we also see that um, organizations, unfortunately, rise and fall. Um, I mean, look at the early 2000s um, and the great hope in, in social movements, um, anti-privatization forum, landless people's movement, etc. Um, that 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 that, uh, that emerged with with big bangs and um, you know very active for for the next five six seven years, um, and are very quiet now uh, for all kinds of challenges internal external what, whatever the case might be, but uh, organizations rise and fall. The point is, I think, not to hinge our hopes on particular organizations only, but but the spirit of dissent. Um, and the spirit of people being willing always to confront the, uh, um, the state when they feel that there's a problem. Um, to work with the state at some points, but also to confront the state. The challenge is on civil society to play both those roles. The one is the, the dissenting, confrontational role, and the other is the kind of uh, mediating and directing role. Name Gina, thank you very much for joining us at Saxes. And thank you to our listeners and viewers for joining us at Saxis. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at www.saxis.org.za.